Welcome back. This is where we left off. Here's where we pick up social machines and capitalism. This actually could end up being a, a bit of an extended discussion, which is why we seem to be doing 30, pretty good on roughly 30 minutes sections. So why don't we just continue with that? See how many it adds up to to make this lecture. Now Deleuze and Guattari are now going to offer, and this is part three really of the text, a genealogy of social machines which take mainly which take three forms they identify three machines primitive territorial barbarian despotic civilized capitalist the reading i've given you is only for the civilized capitalist part not for the other two but i want to talk to you a bit about the other two first in the lecture now it is a genealogy a genealogy like it is for nietzsche and for foucault is in some sense historical but it is not a history. And although Deleuze and Guattari talk a lot about, um, you know, they make reference to various anthropological studies and historical studies, they use historical materials and they make reference to, to different to historical examples. Um, they don't, and, and even though they're called primitive, barbarian, and civilized, they do not um, simply put them in an order, in a historical order. It's not like there were primitive societies and there were barbarian societies and then there were civilized societies in time. There were, in fact, always the later two forms present at the start, and there are always the earlier two forms, so to speak, earlier two forms, primitive and barbaric, present today. So they're mixed together, and you might be able to disaggregate them to an extent, by identifying different societies where where one of them seems more dominant, but it is not meant to be the case that there used to be primitive societies, which before there were states, there were primitive tribal societies, and then there were states, and then there were capitalist states. Right? Um, you know, they, they make this point also in, in, in A Thousand Plateaus. The state was an always existing social form. In fact, these primitive societies could be seen as be structured as they were precisely so that they could stop states' forms from coming about. So they knew that they, you know, they, they had some, some sense that they were there. Okay? Um, they are set up to stop that. They also know that a market is there. Okay? Even primitive societies have some sense that there's a market because they are set up to keep certain things out of any kind of marketized relation, okay? Um, mark, you know, any kind of economic relation of buying and selling, okay? Um, so that's, that's how that functions, all right? Now, each social machine is a social machine that is hierarchical. The three machines are three different hierarchies. Hierarchies can only exist because desires in some way repressed, because desire schizophrenic process is in some way managed, excluded in some cases, absorbed and incorporated in, in, in other ways, managed or controlled in some way, shape, or form. There always has to be some kind of management or suppression of or separation of what it, from what it can do of desire because this process of desire is the greatest challenge to any social hierarchy. So all three of these social machines are set up in some way. They emerge from desire, and they react back upon it in such a way that they seek to suppress and contain it, precisely because desire could overwhelm and destroy it. The quote is, if desire is repressed, keep in mind what repression means, it doesn't just mean arrest. If desire is repressed, it is because every position of desire, no matter how small, is capable of calling into question the established order of society. Despite what some revolutionaries think about this, desire is revolutionary in its essence. No society can tolerate a position of real desire without its structures of exploitation, servitude, and hierarchy becoming compromised. Right? Desire, if it ever becomes free, as schizophrenic prolific um, proliferation of connection is the end of social hierarchy, basically. Quite a claim, but that's, well, we'll see how it works itself out. Okay? So I'm going to give you some of the machines. That's from Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls. I couldn't think of another example for primitive society, so you'll just have to forgive 
and put up with the sort of vulgar ending of this movie. Which is a vulgar movie, but it's funny, because Jim Carrey's in it, and Jim Carrey's funny. So the first two machines seek to contain desire by coding it in some way. And what that means is they submit it to rules and codes, and particularly to qualitative distinctions. So the, the central qualitative distinction of primitive society is the sacred and the profane. Um, primitive societies seek to control desire through a system of kinship exchange that involves family alliances and lines of descent. So that's the marriage scene at the end of when Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls. The, 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 the alliance of the two tribes that's saved because um, Ace locates the sacred white bat that um, it's, it's missing had, had almost created a war between the two tribes, and he, he rescues it and stops it from happening. All right? Um, primitive societies work by alliances. Now, psychoanalysis, Freud, Totem and Taboo, and Levi-Strauss in particu uh, particular, they see these marriage exchanges, the, the famous exchange of women in primitive societies, as a way of warding off incest desire. Okay? If we don't marry the women off to another family, we might you know, have sex with them. And that is the common way this is seen, which is a way of introducing Oedipus into primitive societies. And Deleuze and Guattari, are, you know, their thesis is that Oedipus is... Is, is a not what desire really is. It's a mis it's a it's a it's a rereading of desire in in order to repress it. Um, but it's also specific to capitalism. So it's not found in these societies, and they're quite insistent that there is no need, there is no point, there is no coherence in reading the desire for incest onto what primitive societies are doing. So instead, what they say is going on with these alliances is that there's a is there's an attempt to ward off the desire as proliferating connection by warding off markets, by warding off commodification, be, by, by, by separating something out, which is, a, which, which is um, by maintaining qualitative distinctions, for example, of sacred and profane. Okay? Um, they're really trying to re-, re yeah. I should just read sometimes. Warding off the decoded desires of market exchange. Decoded desires of market exchange, because market exchange is a quantitative exchange which doesn't involve qualitative distinctions. I'm, I'm, we'll pick up on that a little later anyway. So the exchange of women is, involves non-exchangeable elements, things like prestige and honors and gifts and so forth, which the whole point is these are not subject to market exchange. They're not something that can be bought and sold. The exchange of women is not about is not an economic exchange. That's what they're they're, they're trying. That's what they're arguing here. That's the primitive system. There's a lot more to be said about it, but I'm not going to say it here. Um, if you wanted to read chapter four of my political theory after Deleuze, I do have more of the stuff. That stuff. If you want to read even more than that, there's plenty of people who talk about this stuff. If you wanted to read Deleuze and Guattari, you could read the whole book too. But I'm just going to make that point with regards to primitive societies. Then we'll go to the second one, because we really want to get to capitalist societies. So primitive societies code desire, and they make some of it excluded from, you know, simply excluded. And they really are interested in kind of excluding decoded flows of desire, which is what, the, they, which is what markets do. Which is why, even though they're, they're, they're not a market economy, they have some sense of what it, what's wrong with it. Deleuze and Guattari say there's there's a reason why, well, and and when whenever these things are introduced to primitive to societies, they destroy them, don't they? Um, but but that's that's for a, that's for a later period. So then we get to the second one, the despotic, the barbarian despotic machine. That, by the way, is um, parts of a um, the uh, the trailer. For Caligula, a 1979 movie, um, mainstream movie, right, the mainstream theater movie, rated R, even though it was made and produced by Penthouse Magazine, um, about Caligula, you know, the, the Roman emperor who had all of his sexual pleasures satisfied and stuff, and had this curious relationship with his horse, 
among other things, too. But it stars all these major actors and actresses. Helen Mirren is in this, Andy McDowell, John Gielgud is in this, and there were unsimulated sex scenes in an R-rated movie that was shown in actual mainstream theaters in America. Which is itself really interesting, I just have to say. Okay? Caligula is mentioned by Deleuze and Guattari briefly, so that's why um, I also put that here. Um, so the despotic machine, that is the machine of the barbarian state. Okay? It's, it is a state form. It destroys the multiplicity of the primitive alliance system because it replaces it with the unity of a state, of a large state structure, that is ruled by a transcendent, as in stands above society, despot. And desire is controlled within this too. On the one hand, it's given to the emperor, the, the barbarian emperor, um, who has um, all of his desires satisfied. That's the reference to Caligula, who is accused, you know, in, in some of the stories of incest, of sleeping with, with, I think he has two sisters. So there's this royal barbarian incest. The, the, um, the, the, the barbarian despot really does carry out incest. And he uh, maintains a monopoly on desire. Uh, to the hatred of of all of his of all of his subjects of all of his people, um, that does not liberate desire. Uh, Deleuze and Guattari say it overcodes it from this central position. So there's this other thesis which I won't get into here um, that primitive societies code desire. The state overcodes desire. Um, they code the codes, so to speak. So they reduce them to a single to a unity. Um, but, but I, I won't go further into that point. That's one side in which they control this. They also are intent on controlling markets. So market exchange exists within um, the, this, these you know, barbarian state, the state and the emp and empire. But the, um, the goal is to control it quite severely by controlling resources and by taxing um, market exchanges. So the state seeks to use the market and control the market to make money for itself and maintain its supremacy and maintain the supremacy of the emperor and so forth. Um, there is a, an aspect of Oedipus in this social machine, but it's not Oedipal because um, Deleuze and Guattari say it, it doesn't involve the, the um, institutionalization of guilt. Uh, the despots hated and resented, but 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 there's no such thing yet as universal guilt. There's this there's a sense in which the despot is evil and we're good. For example, um, I, I think it it's, it it corresponds uh, when they talk about this. It corresponds to um, Nietzsche's discussion of the Roman emper, Empire and how the Roman Empire has this idea of maximum debt to the gods, but it doesn't yet have this idea of guilt. Um, Anyway, as I say, two social machines that precede capitalism try to code and contain desire, exclude it in some ways, or incorporate it and turn it into a ser and, and put it to the service of the state in, in the second example. And then we come to capitalism. Capitalism doesn't code, it doesn't overcode. There, is co there are codes and overcodings that occur in a capitalist society. We'll get to that in a minute. But capitalism itself does not work by coding and by overcoding of desire. It works by decoding. It releases desire from codes, which means it releases it from rules um, that maintain qualitative distinctions, that maintain moral distinctions, for example, um, that condemn certain desires, um, that seek to exclude them from any place within society, uh, what have you. Instead, what it does is it submits desire to market forces. So it replaces the codes of the earlier machines with an axiomatic. Axiomatics is a term in mathematics for formal rules that are indifferent to the properties or qualities of the elements that fall under them. Set theory rests upon axioms. It's an axiomatic set theory, for example. But this is the point. It's indifferent. So it's a set of rules for formal exchange. That's what the market does, right? And, and markets do have rules of exchange, but they aren't based, they're based on exchange value rather than use value. So you remember your Marx from either the first term course or just a more general knowledge of Marx. A commodity has a use value. Um, everything that is produced to be sold on a market has to be useful in some way. 
whether it keeps you warm or it gives you, provides you with nourishment or it gives you shelter or it does something else. It provides for other, kind, it has other kinds of uses that aren't simply, you know, um, you know for, for survival and well-being. There's, it's pleasurable. Whatever it is, it has a use value, okay? But when it's sold, when it's put on the market, all that matters is how much money you can get for it, what its price is, which means that its uses, which are all related to its qualities, disappears in the exchange. We're simply exchanging its money values. So the qualities are replaced by quantitative values. That's the, that, that's the way the market works for Marx. That's the way it also works here. The capitalist axiomatic is an axiomatic of exchange value. When you exchange items, they of course have use value. The exchange is not concerned with their use value. It's only concerned with money values. And that's the whole point about capitalism, is capitalism is where the exchange values of things become all important. So if you're, a produ if, if you're, a, if you, if you're an owner of either the means of production or you're a retailer or what have you, if you're, if you're on the capitalist side of things, if you're on the business side of things, you have a you have a warehouse full of of some good some commodity you don't look at what that commodity is useful for you just say i have that much money literally in the warehouse because i have that many things which i can sell for so much money um and and then in capitalism that's your workers too right so you don't look at your workers as that's John and Paul and Karen and all the others who have their unique qualities and are really individuals. You're like, this is how much money I can get from the people that I own for at least eight or nine hours of the day and however much more I can bully them into working beyond their normal hours. Bully or cajole or what have you beyond their normal hours. That's the way you look at, you look at them as means to an end. So, capitalist ax capitalism replaces codes with axiomatics. It submits everything to exchange value as much as possible. Okay? Capitalism therefore doesn't try and control desire, it tries to market it and sell it. It's there to, you know, the capitalism is, yay, all desires can be bought and sold. As many as you can get away with can be bought and sold, I should say. Okay? Its general trend is towards, well, what, whenever we talk about a market solution, whenever the government talks about a market solution to a problem, it means talking about it, putting it into a realm of exchange for money and for profit. Okay? Um, let's go on here. Now, capitalism doesn't emerge simply because of the presence of decoded flows of desire, because they've always existed. That's the point. Primitive societies knew they existed and tried to exclude them in some way. Barbarian societies knew that they existed and tried to control them and tax them and so forth. Um, you know, the Socrates is walking around in, in the marketplace in Athens, right? Markets existed long, long ago. So it's not the exist, and, and but Athens isn't a capitalist society. It might be a heavy trading society, and and you know there might be um, what we would what we what we would associate with business elements that are very powerful and so forth. But but and there are wealthy people in it. But we wouldn't call it a capitalist society just as it is a market. Because capitalism isn't just markets, it's something else. Markets deal in decoded flows of desire, we could say. But those have always existed, and that's not what makes a capitalist a capitalist. And it's not a matter of technological development. Capitalism emerges in Europe in, whatever, 19th century, the age of industrial production. But it's not about that. Um, Deleuze and Guattari contend, I don't know the basis of this contention. Um, I, I don't know the, the source, I suppose. Um, there was nothing to stop China in the 13th century from becoming capitalist because it had all of the, all of the technologies and, and the, the power of, of a state because states are still needed for a capitalist mark, economy to work. Um, there was no reason it couldn't be. So why was, you know, if you're going to say it's technology, why didn't China become capitalist? It can't, capitalism can't emerge until there's a shift in the, a fundamental shift in the nature of desire and the creation of a new kind of social machine and desiring machine that carries out, they say, a generalized decoding of flows. 
And so what they say has to emerge is basically a desire to decode or a desire to marketize, a desire to submit more and more things to the market, and therefore a desire for profit. All right? Feudal societies don't have a desire for profit. Even if they have wealthy people, and they have wealthy people who like their wealth, um, it's not a society which is driven by the MCM mode of commodity exchange. Right? Neither are the Greeks, neither are these primitive societies, what have you. Neither is a barter society, what have you. So capitalism requires a certain kind of desire to, to exist, to be, to be a shift in desire so that it becomes that. Right? Um, and then the technologies matter, then the presence of markets matter, and so forth. Okay? Capitalism uh, also augments and intensifies the dynamic by producing both surplus value in the form of profit, but also other kinds of surpluses that are unproductive, i.e. a surplus of unemployed labor, which then plugs back into itself by creating new axiomatics and commodifications. So the thing that capitalism can do is it can invent a market for everything. There's even going to be markets, there's going to be a market for charity, right? There's going to be markets for everything. Um, that is a classic Simpsons episode, which points, puts the point. So many political points are put in that episode, but I'm only giving you a few minutes of it. The background to this episode, which I'm going to insist on telling you, is that Homer is really annoyed with the garbage collection in the neighborhood for some reason, which I now can't remember. Um, but he decides to run for sanitation officer for Springfield, and he runs this horrible dirty tricks campaign, which today is compared to Trump, but it could be compared to all sorts of other dirty tricks campaigns. Um, and he wins election, and he becomes the sanitation officer for Springfield, and he sets about reworking entirely um, all the things that the garbage men in Springfield do until he blows the entire annual budget for sanitation for Springfield the year's budget in one month. So he's out of money, and then he can't pay the garbage men anything at all. So, um, and they're about to go on strike, etc. And he walks into the room with a briefcase full of money. He says, well, cash do, and that settles the impending strike. And then he explains how he got the money, which is that he realized that there was a market for garbage because other cities are looking to get rid of it. So he's going to sell s space in the... Um, abandoned Springfield mine for them to shove their garbage in there. And, and then, of course, the garbage comes up, as you can see, out of the ground and just explodes everywhere, and they end up having to move the town five miles down the road. That's their emergency plan B. Um, they've wrecked, well, capitalism wrecks the ecology, doesn't it? Um, that is what it does. Garbage becomes something you can make profit out of. Everything becomes something you can make profit out of, right? That's why the concerns over submitting, you know, the introducing competition into the NHS ultimately is 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 introducing profit motives into the NHS, marketizing it, uh, which has happened, right? Um, but you can see it happening in, in everything. Well, I mean, um, it's private companies, right, which have which were subcontracted to um, to do uh, test and trace, which has been a which has mar worked out marvelously well for them, it does have to be said. Um, everything is an opportunity for business investment. So that's the other. So that's another aspect of capitalist um, um, desire is that is that it it proliferates in that way, and as I say, it produces all these unproductive things, which can then be in some ways marketized or in, or in other ways drawn into, um, put to use in some way. So it produces more unemployed people, but there are ways you can you can absorb unemployment by giving people by expanding bureaucracy, by expanding the military, right? Um, by by expanding other kinds of things. So psychoanalysis is going to participate in that. Psychoanalysis constitutes, for its part, a gigantic enterprise in the absorption of surplus value. Because psychoanalysis, like anything else is in this world, is about making money in the end, right? There's a market for it, and psychoanalysts will get paid by the hour, right? Um, so it's no surprise that in a capitalist society, all manner of psychological therapies abound because 
even people's misery in it, which you could also think of as, as an unproductive side of, what produces something which is itself unproductive, which is people who can't stand, you know, who are miserable in this world. But it produces a market for that too. So psychoanalysis is also complicit. It's complicit in other ways too, which we'll get to. And, and I guess we've already gotten to, but, but we'll return to later. Okay. Now, here's the point I mentioned before. The old social forms continue in the current social form. These, this, is, this is a genealogy, which means that although this is put in, in a certain kind of historical order, and capitalism is, is a specific kind of social form of the 20th, 19th, 20th centuries, the 21st century now, um, it doesn't mean the other machines disappear. The dominance of decoding and axiomatization doesn't mean that the codes of the old machines disappear. And it's the same as, as with Foucault. I've made this point in, in the lectures. Disciplinary and normalizing society doesn't mean that old systems of power, sovereign power, uh, disappears. There are still police forces. There are still, like, you know, there, there are still not... This, our society might be, defi might be defined for Foucault by these quite subtle mechanisms of power. But it doesn't mean that, you know, police and military force doesn't still exist and doesn't get deployed. People don't get arrested. People don't get, um, um, you know, other, you know, other, you know, other kinds of just, just brute uses of force that are associated with the old sovereign threat of punishment, threat of death. That that doesn't that doesn't exist today. So, modern society. Um, just simply, in the same way, modern society isn't defined by those f uses of negative sovereign force and power. It's the same with Deleuze and Guattari. Modern, the, the code still exists. It's that a modern society is defined by the axiomatics. It's not defined by the, the codes and the, and, and the, the, um, the, the, me the mechanisms of the older machines that still survive. What happens is that those older mechanisms come to support the market and the axiomatization of desire that defines the capitalist social social machine. So the codes continue to exist, sometimes they appear anachronistic, but they're continually adapted to present conditions and they're put into continual variation. So there are codes, right? There are codes and there are laws that exist even if everything gets marketized. There are still codes and rules for what makes um, a capitalist, what makes a worker, what makes a merchant banker, what makes something else. All right, there are still rules, and there's still a state, but the state is now going to be a support for the market. It's not that the capitalists just run the state, but what the state is doing is ultimately regulating the market, and markets still need to be regulated. This is the point. They're they're called free markets, but but every market has to have some kind of regulation in it, however much you want to. Quite deregulated. So the state becomes a support for the market as opposed to the state being this thing which is trying to tax the hell out of the market to maintain the state. Okay. Um, and, and again, that's the other point here, the, the axiomatization, um, the, the codes are submitted to axiomatization. I've actually just made this point. <laughs> anyway, the state is retained but it becomes a support for the market. Um, and it also absorbs a lot of the, a lot of the excess, the unproductive excesses that the market produces, so through its military and through its bureaucracy and so forth. If you're down on your luck and you can't get a job anymore, you go into the army, right? Um, I think you still do. Do you still do this? Anyhow. All right. Capitalism and psychoanalysis. This is a good place to stop. Okay. Um, we're at 30 minutes. I think the next part will be the last part. So we're going to have six parts that are about 30 minutes. So it'll be about three hours, maybe three hours and 10 minutes. Okay, longest lecture in the end, but we'll be through it shortly. See you for the next part.